Welcome to Risk Awareness Week 2019. Uh, this presentation is on state of the state of the art in quantitative risk assessment. This is session three of three sessions, how to perform a state of the art quantitative risk assessment. Previous sessions one and two, if you have not seen them, you may want to go and replay those. They'll provide a lot of background for what we're gonna go through today. Uh, my name is Mark Powell. Uh, I've been working in risk and project management and systems engineering for almost 50 years now. Uh, worked in a great variety of, of projects and in, in a lot of different environments and uh, have want to share with you some things that I've learned over almost almost five decades. So as I say, you may want to look at sessions one and two and replay and please by all means ask questions. Uh, you can use the comment or the question section down in your uh, in your box there. As I said, it's been presented in three sessions. The first session we talked about a philosophy and framework. Tried to abstract abstract quantitative risk assessment to something that all of us can understand. We all have done it. We have all been involved in risk assessment and making decisions our our, our whole lives. But I've tried to abstract things to where people from a wide, wide variety of environments uh, can talk about it, understand it, discuss it. So that was the primary objective of session one. We, we came up with some concepts that I think will be of value to you, uh, whether you actually ever perform a state-of-the-art quantitative risk assessment or not. In session two, we went through some discussion really actually executed more of the thinking that's involved associated with a quantitative risk assessment. We looked at the math involved in a quantitative risk assessment. We didn't look at the math that one requires to model the causalities and the sensitivities in your risk problem. And we went through the algorithm and the code that needs, that needs to be developed to perform a state-of-the-art quantitative risk assessment. One of the things for the algorithm that we need to perform a state-of-the-art state of the art quantitative risk assessment, one of the things is that there's no way to build a, a general tool to perform that. Every problem is unique and you pretty much have to code up the solution, code up the numerical method that we use to solve them uh, for every single problem. It's not complicated code, it's simple. Most everybody has learned how to code at one time or not, or not in their lives, and it's, it's pretty easy to do. And in fact, in, uh, in presentations that I've made to PMI, I've had some C-level executives actually coding up these problems and using them to solve complicated decision problems that they have. So that's what we covered in session one and session two. I recommend if you haven't seen them, go back and replay them. I think you'll find them interesting uh, with some novel things. We're actually going to apply everything in this session that we had in session one and session two. I'll go through a quick overview of what we did. This session, we're gonna talk about the process steps to perform a state-of-the-art quantitative risk assessment, and I'm going to give you some real-world examples. These real-world examples primarily come from aerospace and space and defense, and they're complicated, but they exhibit the types of problems that we get into when we need a quantitative risk assessment, where the, they're, they're actually larger than the quantitative risk assessment process itself. However, I will show you today how we can use that quantitative risk assessment to solve the overall larger problem. And those problems all have to do with how we make good decisions. So we'll go through those things today. Let me review from sessions one and two. A quantitative risk assessment provides for us, a state-of-the-art quantitative risk assessment that is, provides for us probabilities for every known outcome or worse, or every known outcome or better, every possible outcome, for every point of time in the future of the project, okay? Once we have all of those probabilities for every possible outcome or worse at every time in the project, we can literally find the optimal decision, okay? One of the things that we covered is it can be easier 
and actually much cheaper to actually perform a state-of-the-art quantitative risk assessment than to do a qualitative risk assessment. One of the things that I mentioned, everybody has uh, probably been involved in one of those pull your hair out group group sessions of 20 to 50 senior people all expressing their opinion of what a risk should be and what the risk actually is to try and pin it on a matrix. And we've seen those sessions, those maybe full day sessions, uh, <clears throat> facilitated by a high paid risk consultant who that's what they do for a living is go facilitate it, pin the risk on the matrix sessions. That's a lot of money where you, whereas if you learn how to do a state of the art quantitative risk assessment, you pretty much can do it in two hours or less. One person, even a super expensive quantitative, super expensive consultant who does that for you, two hours of their time is going to be a whole lot less than the expense of that group guy. So it's a dirty little secret that it can be cheaper and also it can be a lot easier. I mentioned sometimes, I don't know about you, but I've been in some of those sessions where I've literally wanted to pull my hair out. So not pull it, not wanting to pull my hair out, I consider it to be a lot easier. So those are the things that we came up with, with as far as quantitative risk assessments. Another aspect that I want to point out is the qualitative risk assessment is always going to employ a guess. And there's one, ex there's one, uh, one way that we can actually take the information from guesses and actually apply them in a quantitative risk assessment such that they are qualitative here. Our state-of-the-art quantitative risk assessments are completely objective. We don't have to use guesses. We don't have to use assumptions. We don't have to use expert opinion. We can, and it's useful to use those things, but when we do use them, we can still be objective about them. There's some math. Not a whole lot, surprisingly. Most things you can just look up. There's some statistics. Surprisingly, not a whole lot. Mainly, we just have to calculate probabilities. And to calculate those probabilities, we have to do some coding. But the coding is relatively simple, and it's not hard. So let's get into it. Let's talk about how to perform a quantitative, a state-of-the-art quantitative risk assessment. <clears throat> Recall. The reason why we do risk assessments is so we can make good decisions. That's the whole reason why. And we do these thousands of times a day. Believe it or not, we do it thousands of times a day. We need the probability, in order to make a good decision, we need the probability, given all of our data and information that's available to us, that the outcome that's going to be realized at some level or worse, or some level or better, at some point in the future, we're always making decisions about some outcome that's going to be realized in the future or to try to achieve a particular outcome in the future. <clears throat> and if you wrote this down as an equation, it'd be the probability of the outcome at some point in the future or up to some point in the future. T greater than now, it's always in the future, is greater than or equal to some outcome level X, given our data and information. Each alternative for our decision has different outcomes, has a whole different spectrum of possible outcomes. For example, in what I call big RM risk management, the formal job of the formal risk management organization on a, on a project, they have to facilitate a decision where the alternatives are one, if we accept the risk, which means we can t commit the contingency and get whatever outcome is realized, if the outcome becomes OBE, overcome by events, before the end of the project, obviously we have a cost savings. If we choose to monitor and reassess when new data appears, the outcome might be realized or the actual risk levels, the probabilities, increase or decrease for a particular outcome level. And we act. Now, that action may be to accept the risk or it may be to continue monitoring, or it may be the third alternative that we consider, and that is to mitigate, which is basically setting up a project with the sole purpose of increasing the probability that a less undesirable or a less unacceptable outcome will be realized. We want to reduce the probability that an unacceptable one is, is, is going to be realized as well. 
So we're always trying to move from a less acceptable outcome space to a more acceptable outcome space. And that's what we do those with our decisions. The process has a number of steps. The first step is, and this is a step that you really need to do with any risk, whether you're doing qualitative or quantitative, you want to analyze the problem. You want to understand the range of possible outcomes. You also want to understand the, what causes, the causality involved for those particular outcomes, and also the sensitivities. You want to identify the uncertainties, what's uncertain, and develop an appropriate uncertainty model for those. Now that's an art, but it's an art that you have to do, and it is a mathematical modeling process. But this you have to do for any sort of risk assessment. <clears throat> you want to identify all the relevant data and information that's available to you for this particular problem. You then are going to have to formulate the integrand that you need an answer for. In other words, every probability is an integral. Okay, so you have to have the integrand that you want integrated, and you have to formulate that. The formulation is not that difficult, and we, we gave some examples. We'll give even more examples of it in this presentation. You'll have to write the code to do a Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling of this integrand. In session two, we talked about Markov chain Monte Carlo and its benefits. You're obviously going to have to tune that Markov chain and also look for uh, burn in to get a stationary set of statistics for the Markov chain. And you tune those, tune those samples by trial and error. It's a really simple process, and it uses basically two things, the acceptance ratio for the new sample that you calculate in the algorithm, Metropolis-Hastings algorithm, and also, does it visually look like noise? You have to evaluate the risk or the decision, decision discriminator for those particular outcomes that you're looking at, at all of those samples. Once you have that, you have the uncertainty space for the risk, the uncertainty space for the decision discriminator. And it's very easy using Monte Carlo calculations to compute the needed probabilities. Once you have those samples, whether they're from a built-in sampler or whether they're from a Markov chain, and decide based on this risk assessment. That's literally the process. You'll note, a whole lot of it you have to do whether you're doing a state-of-the-art quantitative risk assessment or not. You really should. If you don't analyze it properly, identify your data, you don't understand what integral you're trying to solve, uh, the rest of it really doesn't make a lot of sense. You're in qualitative risk assessment space. You may as well just stay there at a high level. <clears throat> Let me give you a walkthrough of this process for a real-world example. Now, I've simplified this example and made it more of a textbook type example, but We'll walk through it. This is a case for NASA. NASA has the Orion Crew Exploration Vehicle, which is soon to be taking uh, ferry and crew to and from the, the International Space Station. Uh, <clears throat> in their development, they have a launch abort system on it. If y'all remember Apollo, you remember there was this funny little stick rocket on top of the Apollo capsule? That stick up there was the launch abort system. And what that did was if there was a problem with the boosters, they could fire that launch abort system, lift off the Apollo capsule way high in the air, disengage it, and pop the parachutes out and float the astronaut safely back to the water. They always land over water. Now, that launch abort system has a requirement, a very high reliability requirement of 99.73% that it fires for 23 seconds. It takes 23 seconds. And interestingly enough, they have to fire that with every mission, whether they abort the mission or not, because they have to get it off the capsule. They don't want to carry that extra weight to orbit. So they're willing to accept a risk of 0.27% that it will not fire for 23 seconds, or else they have to go design one that will meet that requirement. <clears throat> So of course, what do they do? They go test a bunch of these, a bunch of these rockets, and they note when they fail and how long they survived. 
In other words, they test them generally for 23 seconds. If it's still operating at 23 seconds, they consider it a success. It did not fail. If some of them fail during that 23 seconds, they note the failure time. So that's our data, okay? What we need to know is how sure we can be that the launch abort system reliability at 23 seconds exceeds that 99.73%. That's what we need to know. We want to be very sure. And basically what NASA decided is they want to be 90 plus percent sure that the reliability at 23 seconds was 99.73% to accept the design for the launch abort system. <clears throat> Step one, understand the thing about which you're uncertain. Well, clearly, the uncertainty question we need to answer is based on our data, how sure can we be that the reliability of the launch abort system is greater than 99.73% for a 23 second fire? That's what we're uncertain about. <clears throat> Second, what is the specific item that is uncertain? In this case, it's the reliability of the launch abort system at 23 seconds. Third, what are the data or information available or to be obtained? They hadn't at this point run the test, but when they run those tests, they will have failure times and survivor times. Survivor times will all be 23 seconds. Fourth, what are the physics or other unrelated conditions, the causal effects, the causal models, and the sensitivities <clears throat> associated with the data and the uncertain item that we're worried about. Well, we know that failures can only occur after you start the test, okay, after time t equals zero. But they may never occur at all. In other words, it may go out, it may run forever. Our failure and survivor data are all independent. What that says is that whatever model we use is going to be one-sided. This is a one-sided, always greater than the start of the test. Step two, identify suitable models for the uncertainty. Are the uncertain items continuous or discrete? In this particular case, because we're talking about failure times and survivor times, they're continuous. They can happen at any instant between zero and the 23 seconds. Are the uncertain items or data two-sided, one-sided, or limited to a specific range? By two-sided, it means it goes from minus infinity to positive infinity. Clearly not. These are one-sided data. They can only start after t equals zero, and then they could possibly go to infinity. We have another case. Data can be restricted to a particular interval, a specific range. So we need to know that for our identifying our suitable models for the uncertainty. Should the model be unimodal or multimodal? Now what, I, what that means is there's more than one mode, more than one peak. A lot of people are only familiar with unimodal probability models. Those are the ones that are typically built in with random number generators for them into most tools. They're unimodal. Occasionally, you'll find a bivariate Gaussian, which is also unimodal, but it is bivariate. But multimodal models have multiple peaks, not just a single peak. And it turns out many, many things in nature are multimodal. In this particular case, we have no reason to believe that there's more than a single failure mode of that rocket. So in that case, a very suitable model, the most general one-sided unimodal model that we have is the Weibull model. So it should work well. But the problem that we always run into, and here's where a lot of times we make guesses, we're uncertain about what values of the scale parameter eta and the shape parameter beta should be used. We're uncertain about that. So now, even though we figured out what the model should be, we're uncertain about the parameter values. Well, we write out the probability equation for step three. And of course, that's formulating the integral. Based on the model we derived or something, write out the risk assessment. Now, at the highest level, we write out probability that the risk at 23, given the uncertain quantities that we've got, eta and beta, is greater than 99.73% given our data. Our data are our failures and our survivors. And of course, the reliability given eta and beta, which we're uncertain about, is simply that exponential you see on the right side of the equal sign. That's based on the Weibull model. Now that's an equation that you'll need to write. There are some many equations I'm gonna show you that you don't need to write. So it's kind of important. I'm gonna point these out to you. But that's the kind of thing that you should be able to write just offhand for your problem. 
Now what we need to infer from the data, the uncertainty model for the parameters of the Weibull model, eta and beta, scale parameter eta and the shape parameter beta. Okay. And of course, we're going to use our famous equation, which is from the fourth axiom of probability, which we went through in session two. You don't need to write that out. You'll just need to use that. And clearly, the first term in that equation is the likelihood. For our independent failure times, the likelihood is the product of the viable density evaluated these failure times. If you use maximal likelihood, maximum likelihood estimation, you've used the likelihood function. This is the same likelihood function. However, you can also use, for the likelihood, you can incorporate survivor data. Okay, that's what the, the failure time likelihood would look like. And since all of the data are independent, the failures are independent of the survivors, it's simply a product of these two. For the M independent survivors at 23 seconds, the likelihood is the product of the probabilities that the failure would occur after 23 seconds, which is just the reliability, same equation that we had on the other page. It's just the product of all of those that we have, those M. And of course, the total likelihood is just the product of those two. Now, you need to write that out, but that's rather straightforward. It just falls out just really nicely uh, once you've analyzed the problem and identified the model. So this is not hard. These are equations you write, but they're very, very easy equations to write. Step five, we, ob we select objective models for the parameters of those uncertainty models. Remember, the only thing we've got uncertain now are the parameters for uncertainty models. So we could choose objective models for those, which avoids any guesses, any assumptions, any expert opinions, etc. We use objective priors. They're derived one of three ways. I'll remind you. From information theory, I might add. Find the model that minimizes the Fisher information, developed in 1939 by Sir Harold Jeffries. Find the model that maximizes the information entropy, Lindley and Savage. That Savage is Sam's dad. Sam is one of the presenters for Risk Awareness Week 2019, but his dad actually invented this technique. Find the model that maximizes the expected value of perfect information, Bernardo and Smith, 1995. And all three, of course, produce the same model for the same problem as they will for this problem. For the Weibull model parameters, you could just go look these up and write them down. They're simply the product of, of one over eta and one over beta. Very simple. You need that equation. You need to write it down, but you need to look it up first. It's not one you'll have to derive. You can, of course, derive it. Next, you write out the formula for the integrand. Simply multiply the likelihood formula times the prior formula. That's easy. You need to write that equation down, but it's easy. You've got those two parts that you wrote down, you write this down. Next, we create an MCMC sampler for this posterior and, and obtain a tuned set of samples. You write out the code to sample this integrand. It's relatively simple using the Metropolis Hastings algorithm. You run it multiple times until you obtain a good set and a large set of samples of the variables of integration without any burn-in and with a suitable acceptance ratio. And also, the scatter plot of those samples looks like noise. Pretty straightforward and easy. You can do all the tuning with a small number of samples, runs real quick, takes minutes to do. Obtain a large number of samples once you've got it tuned. Now, it's joint samples of eta and beta. Next, we calculate the risk samples of interest using each set of each particular pair of MCMC samples. And usually that's a one line of code calculation. We create those samples by evaluating the risk at the samples of the integrand. It's real simple. We get samples of our risk or our reliability at 23 seconds given the data simply by evaluating that function at every pair of samples. That's an equation you need to write, but you've already written that down. It's a simple line of code to write. Now, I want to point out to you, I pointed out in session two that we can actually use Markov chain Monte Carlo to do integral transforms. This particular simple Monte Carlo operation provides us the uncertainty model we need by approximating an integral transform. And I've written it out for you. Now that is one nasty integral. Basically, we integrate 
out. You'll notice on the left side, we're only entered. We don't have, you don't see in the left side of that equation, left side of the proportional, we do not see eta and beta anymore. The reason why is on the right side, we've integrated them out. Now, I cannot do that integral analytically. Nobody can. I've not been able to find anything in Abramowitz and Stegen or a Gradstein and Rizik to find any way to perform that integral. So we have to resort to the Markov chain Monte Carlo. When we do that, we can actually solve that integral very quickly with one line of code. We don't have to write out this particular equation, which is nice. But the fact is, is you could. And if somebody were to challenge what you've done, you could say, oh, this is what we accomplished, and write out that equation. And I guarantee you they won't uh, ask you any more questions. So we calculate those risk samples. And then we use our standard Monte Carlo calculations to answer the probability question. Count the number of samples of the risk above the threshold and divide by the number of samples. Count the number of, of reliability at 23 samples, greater than 0 0.9973, 99.73%, and divide by N. N was 10,000, we divide by 10,000. Now, interestingly enough, this simple operation provides us our answer we need, and it approximates this integral. I'm writing this integral out for you. And there it is. Of course, you look at that integral and you see that, just like the previous one I showed you, you can't get the analytical expression. However, by that simple step of counting the number of samples of the reliability at 23 seconds, greater than 0.9973, We've got our answer, okay? You don't have to write that one out. It's nice to know that you could, though, that there is an actual equation behind what we're doing. So many people do Monte Carlo and never realize that there are very, very complex integral transform and integral equations behind doing it. And if the result is above the threshold of 0.9, 90%, if we're 90% sure the reliability is greater than 99.73% at 23 seconds, we accept the launch abort system. Now, since, since the, the uh, <clears throat> Orion capsule is about ready to be used, clearly we pass this test. So that's a walkthrough. Now what I'm going to do is and I'm, I'm going to abstract a level one higher and really take you into, that was just for doing a state-of-the-art quantitative risk assessment. We really didn't look at a real-world risk assessment problem as they're typically presented to us. Now we're going to go through four case studies where we do. And the, the nice thing is we're going to demonstrate how we can use state-of-the-art quantitative risk assessment to address all of those higher-level problems as well. So let's go to it. These examples are more realistic than my walkthrough. Generally, decision makers don't like to reveal their, their personal risk tolerance. And quite often, they don't tell us what, an, what outcome level or assurance level is going to be acceptable. I mean, we had that for the launch abort system example, but we generally don't have that. There's a solution to that. We parameterize to enable those decisions. And it's very easy to do. In every case, in these cases I'm going to present to you, there were extreme realizable outcomes where doing something a little different from qualitative risk assessment, in other words, using guesses to make our decisions, was extremely important. We had to have optimal decisions. In every single case, the decisions were made very, very quickly and comfortably. Once the results of the state-of-the-art quantitative risk assessment were presented, and I'm going to tell you, most of these cases, uh, when, these, these, when, when this was presented to the board over and over and over before we did a state-of-the-art quantitative risk assessment for them, they had, had multiple repeats and maybe six months to a year of discussion before making a decision. I don't know if you've seen it or not, but sometimes delays to make decisions quite often cost you more than even making a wrong decision. But once these results were presented, decisions were made very quickly and comfortably, and they're very important decisions. 
we're going to see some demonstration of some very useful graphics for presenting state-of-the-art quantitative risk assessment and just risk assessments in general, whether they're qualitative or quantitative. So I'm going to demonstrate some very useful graphics as well. So these examples are a little bit more thorough. And the real trick is that each one of these took less than two hours time to produce the results. Now, that doesn't include developing a presentation. Usually that can take more, take longer than actually do, doing the analysis and the coding and the math and getting the results. Each one of these took less than two hours. Case study one. This is, all of these are going to be from the aerospace industry, but the problems, believe it or not, can be translated very easily to any other industry, any other field. The way you solve the problems, but they highlight some real issues. This is a case for the space shuttle. They had cargo transfer bags that they used to pack things in to put in the shuttle, and it was a risk assessment for the zipper. They were worried it was getting close to end of life for the shuttle program, and they had a bunch of bags that had been used a bunch of times. The bags had a spec for how how reliable the zipper had to be, but they started to worry that, well, maybe some of the zippers might not last long enough for the end of the program. They didn't want to start a new procurement to buy new bags to make sure that they were still safe for use on the shuttle. So let's talk about that. They ran a test. They're to be carried. Now, the problem with them, if the zipper busts on the space shuttle during launch or, or landing, something could break out of the bag, pierce the hull of the shuttle, shuttle, and as we know, when that happens, we lose the whole vehicle and the whole crew. It's a terrible disaster. It turned out that the required zipper life for the specification was that it be survived 2,000 cycles. That was what they had. They didn't, it was presumed to be like 100% reliability. They had not specified a particular reliability on it. This is classic. We don't get real numbers. We don't get real specifications, but they had a required zipper life, zipper life, but yet it's not stated in probabilistic terms. And of course, if it fails a loose object to penetrate the hull, you lose the vehicle, just like we lost the uh, Challenger in Columbia. They performed a simple test. What they did is they took one cargo transfer bag and they zipped it open and shut 8,000 times, and it succeeded without failing. Uh, that's all they had. They still did not know how risky it was. Now, they weren't going to use any to 8,000 cycles. In fact, they had a few that were up in the thousands, but they weren't going to run several hundred flights. But they still wanted to know the risk because everybody started to get nervous at the end of the program about the risk to the vehicle. The relevant question. How sure can you be from that one test result that the true risk of the zipper failure by 2,000 cycles is below some acceptable level? We don't know what that acceptable level. And we don't even know how sure they need to be. And we only have this one particular datum, which is a censored datum. They did not have a failure after 8,000 cycles. Now, the quantitative risk assessment setup that we have. There was no clear decision rule for this. So our solution, the decision discriminator was the risk of failure by 2,000 cycles, which was the planned lifetime. They never expected to get quite that far. They didn't have an acceptable risk for failure. So our solution is we parameterize as a function of different ranges of acceptable risk to show them. They didn't have an acceptable assurance level how sure they wanted to be. Like in our launch abort system example, we knew that we had to be 90% sure that the risk of failure was greater than, was, was less than 0.27%. So we have to parameterize as a function of assurance levels. Now, this is clearly, we look at it, we do our analysis. This is another failure. We have no reason to believe that we have more than one failure mode involved. It's the most general one-sided model, so it's a suitable model to use for our uncertainty. And, of course, we're uncertain about the parameter values again. The one datum we have is that one test result, and it's a sensor datum, 8,000 cycles without a failure. That's not a lot of data. We have one bag. 
but yet they want to know what the risk is. Our integrand is simply the likelihood times the prior. Prior we choose to make the Markov chain stabilize. Uh, pseudo ignorance prior, one over eta for the eta variable, and we set that, we limit that to less than 30,000 cycles. Clearly, that's 15 times more than the planned lifetime, which they never expect to see. Also, for beta, which is our failure mode parameter, our shape parameter, if beta is less than one, you have an infant mortality mode. Well, none of these zippers have shown. We have no reason to believe, and we only believe it's a wear out mode which means beta is going to be larger than one. And also because we, it, we limit the, the, er, the, the old age wear out to a beta of 20, which is way the way the heck out there for beta. Beta normally never gets more than about four or five in real world situations. So we, we limited it. And that's so our Markov chain will stabilize. The likelihood is the probability the zipper would not fail, just the reliability of 8,000 cycles. We can write that down. It's pretty simple. Our test datum, success, successful 8,000 cycles without a failure. We, we have said that zipper cycling can improve the reliability. That's our pseudo ignorance prior for beta. The cargo bags won't be used for more than 30 cycles. That's kind of a duh type, uh, type boundary that we put on there. There's no stated minimum acceptable risk, so we parameterize as a function of possible acceptable risk levels. And here's what we've got. We also have the assurances here. We, from this chart, what we found out, we are 75% sure that the true risk of failure at, at 2,000 cycles is less than 1%. We're 88% sure that the risk of the failure by 2,000 cycles is five, less than 5%. We're 94% sure, based on these results, that the risk of failure by 2,000 cycles is 10% or less. And we're 98% sure that it's 20% or less. We had a problem. A decision needed to be made, but nobody told us what the decision parameters would be. So when we did our state-of-the-art quantitative risk assessment, we knew 2,000 was really what they were worried about. So we parameterize as a function of assurance and risk levels. And guess what? They continued to use these cargo, cargo transfer bags for the rest of the show. They made this decision instantly. This had been a discussion point at the safety review panels at NASA for more than a year before I presented this particular one chart. So this is how you get decisions made very, very quickly. By the way, it took less than two hours to develop these results. But it took a little bit of thinking, just a little bit of math, and just a little bit of coding to produce these results. But yet we got a very, very effective, quick, comfortable decision. Case study two. This is another NASA example. On the International Space Station, they have an X, EVA stands for extravehicular activity. It's when the astronauts go outside the station or outside the vehicle in spacesuits. And what a lot of people don't realize is that the while the inside of the space shuttle or the inside of the space station is pressurized to you know sea level pressure 14.7 pounds per square inch spacesuits only have a pressure of about 4.2 pounds per square inch which is the equivalent of of uh, mount everest <clears throat> now, there, there are very few people on the planet who have ascended mount everest without oxygen and of course the space suits provide oxygen but uh, it's very, very dangerous going to that from a very high pressure scenario to a very low pressure scenario because of nitrogen narcosis. And of course, the solution then is the bends. And it works both ways, going into the low pressure and then coming back into the pressure situation, just like what a diver experiences. You go down too fast, you're liable to get the bends. You come up too fast, you're liable to get the bends. The, uh, and of course, an astronaut outside who gets the bends is liable to just float away. My understanding is the bends are so painful, they're just liable to float away. You lose the astronaut. So we have to avoid that. Solution to that is to put the astronaut on like a, a uh, ergometer, a stationary bike, and have them breathe a high percentage of oxygen. 
what you want to do is you want to saturate the tissues with oxygen instead of nitrogen so they don't get nitrogen bubbles in their blood. Well, they had a risk assessment that needed to be done. Turned out that the sensor that they had on the ergometer measuring the oxygen the astronauts were taking was drifting with time. Okay? They had observed this to happen. Now, the way these sensors work is they put these, they, they test these sensors, get them all calibrated. 180 days later, they send them up on, on the spacecraft. They, they put them on the ergometer. They replace the sensors on the ergometer, and then they use them for 90 days after that. So they're supposed to be calibrated and stay within calibration for 270 days. And if the measured, measured O2 is an error by more than plus or minus six millimeters of mercury within that 270 days, you can kill an astronaut. If it measures, if it measures six millimeters high, the astronauts are not getting enough oxygen, they might get the bends. If it measures six millimeters low, they may be getting too much oxygen and have oxygen toxicity in the brain and kill the astronaut before they ever go out or later. They're already compensating for pressure variations in the sensor uh, for the measurement, actually, and, and those measurement vary, those, those compensations were successful. So their proposed solution alternatives were, one, to test for the drift rates of these sensors, because they can do that on the ground and compensate for the drift, just like they're doing for pressure variations, or do a total redesign of the O2 sensor, and then and ship it up to the International Space Station. That meant there would be no EVAs for probably two years, which the space station would not survive if they had no EVAs in two years. So that was a really un, unpalatable alternative that they had. Or they could just possibly kill the astronauts, which is an unpalatable as well. The questions that they had, they didn't even know what the existing risk of sensor actually drift beyond the acceptable limits was. And what was the risk after the proposed drift compensation? I'll talk about that in just a second. The test data that they had, they took five sensors and tested them. The variations that you see uh, in each color have to do with uh, variations in O2 level. So these were the errors that they had in the calibration. Now, one of the interesting things, they looked at this data, and you see the red lines for minus 6 millimeters and plus 6 millimeters, which they could, couldn't ex exceed. And you notice the first excursion beyond that was at about 80 days since calibration. Clearly, there's a problem. There's a risk. The risk is real. And it's real early. So they noticed that these things all have pretty close to the same slope. So what if they take all of these five sensors, did a linear fit with least squares, and then took that linear fit, compensated with that linear fit, took it out of the data, of the calibration? Well, they did this, and this is the results that they got. Well, at first glance, it looks really good. It says, wow, everything is inside the bounds except for a few points. And lo and behold, they're thinking that, that the risk actually increased. Earlier, they had an excursion at 50 days. With this calibration, they might kill an astronaut at, at well, they don't go up until 180 days. The sensor doesn't go up to 100 days. They might kill them even earlier. But they've already got problems. So they didn't know what to do. They didn't know what the real risk was. was. They knew there was a possible possibility. And they didn't know what the risk was afterwards. So here, we go through our risk assessment setup, our state-of-the-art quantitative risk assessment setup. Here again, this is like real world. We don't really have a clear decision rule like we had in the launch abort system uh, example. The decision discriminator, the risk of measurement area is getting too big by 270 days. That means greater than six or less than minus six by 270 days, okay? They didn't have an acceptable risk for an unacceptable measurement error. They didn't have an acceptable assurance. They didn't even know what it was to begin with, much less what the assurance, how sure they wanted to be. And, of course, the solutions in these, these times when you're faced with these things and you're in these important meetings and somebody needs to know what you're going to do, quite often you have to parameterize to solve these things. They had already used least squares. I would never use the Gaussian model for reasons which, if you have a question about why not, I'd be more than happy to answer that. I've answered it many times on LinkedIn. 
but because it was uh, a least square solution, I used a Gaussian model. It wasn't going to be realistic, but it was going to be suitable for what we were doing for the measurement errors. The mean of the errors, as we see, tends to drift with time. Variance, however, stays pretty much the same. So we use a simple linear drift model for the mean. Now we have, instead of just one parameter for the mean, we have two parameters, whatever the, whatever the intercept is and whatever the slope is. So now we have three, not just two parameters in our model that we're uncertain about. Whatever the intercept is, whatever the rate of change is, and the variance. Our errors, therefore, uh, have a mean that is changeable as a function of time. The variance stays the same. So our data, well, we have the pre-drift corrected measurement errors and at their times to assess the risk before drift correction. And we have the post-corrected measurements to assess the risk after drift correction. A little bit more setup. The integrand is the likelihood times the prior. I'm going to throw some ugly equations at you, but they're all Gaussian equations, so they should be easy and familiar. We needed objective priors. Now, since, since the mean is a simple, if you go look up the mean for the normal distribution, you'll find that it is a simple constant one. That's our objective prior. And for the standard deviation, it is one over the standard deviation. It is the inverse. So you look those up and say Bernardo and Smith, and we use those two. They're very simple models. Our likelihood is the product of the density measurements, the densities at the measurements at those times. And I'm going to write out the logarithm of that likelihood for you because it turns out, it turns out to a real, real simple equation. You'll see there at the bottom to the right of the proportional sign. I went ahead and left out the, the, uh, the constants since we're leaving out constants anyway. So uh, the multiplicative constants, but it comes out to a pretty simple expression that we can code. Now that's the logarithm. We're always going to use the logarithm with the metropolis hastings algorithm anyway. Simple equation, relatively easy to code that in a single line of code. Now, after we ran our analysis, what I've presented for you here and what I presented at this was what we call density strips. So the way a density strip works is Let's look at the one on the right, the upper one. The bar on the left is at the fifth percentile. The bar at the right is the 95th percentile. The color density that you see, the purple color density you see, is directly proportional to the probability density. And the dark line there, I believe, is at the mode, the peak of the probability distribution that we got from our risk assessment. Now, the upper one is the existing risk. That's without drift compensation. The lower one, which looks like just a solid black line over there on the lower left, is the risk assessment. The same, a very, very similar uh, risk density strip plotted on the left. But because of our linear scale, it's a little bit distorted. Well, it's going to get worse distorted if we look at it with a logarithmic scale. However, we get more details at that lower level of the risk with the drift compensation. Obviously, we see the risk. Now, let me point out something on the chart on the left. We can see real clearly that we're 90% sure that the risk of an excursion beyond plus and minus six mill millimeters of mercury before any kind of correction ranges between 36% and 46%. That means we're 95% sure it's greater than 36%. We're 95% sure it's less than 46%. So we're 90% sure that it's a pretty big number. Okay? Clearly a 35, 35 to 45%, 36 to 46% risk is unacceptable for NASA. But we need to look at the risk, the density strip, with drift compensation. And we look down here. And gee, the right side of that density strip is like at 1.5%. We're 95% sure that the risk of going outside that excursion is less than 1.5%. I won't even bother with the lower end or the 90% error. Rate. But that's what we get. Now, the density strips are great for making risk distribution comparisons. And this is a great example. And I'll let you know, they immediately decided the risk that the compensation was 
fabulous. They could not tell that from the charts of the data, though. They really were considered, you know, looking back at those, uh, they were really concerned that they'd actually worsen the risk with the drift compensation. But they made a decision right then and there. This is something that had been going on for more than a year, being presented to the Safety Review House. Let's, let me summarize real quick. Without drift compensation, the risk of exceeding the accuracy limits of 270 days is between, we're 90% sure it's between 36 and 46%. With drift compensation, we're 95% sure the risk of exceeding the accuracy limits of 270 days is less than 1.5%. Easy to make a decision. Even though nobody had specified how sure they had to be. I could have used density strips that went over a different range, and I could have considered other ranges as well. But this was the first shot at it, used just best engineering judgment as to what to present, and it solved the problem. They obviously, just like they're using with the pressure and just like they're using with the drift, they could use O2 level compensation that would reduce the risk even further. I don't think they bothered with that. Made a decision very quickly, very comfortably when these results were presented. And as I said, we were set up, we didn't know what they wanted to do or what they were comfortable with. We found something with our quantitative risk assessment. Case study three, this is another NASA one. This is an important one. <clears throat> Astronauts, when they go in space in zero gravity, minerals leach out of their bones. In fact, it's said after an astronaut has been up for a few weeks in zero gravity, that they have the bones of an 80-year-old woman. We know women tend to be more susceptible to, to uh, osteoporosis and osteopenia. Astronauts have the same sort of effect. And of course, the longer you're up in space, the more minerals leach out. The only things that we know to do are to try to use exercise. There has been some discussion of putting them on osteoporosis drugs, but there are side effects that you don't want to take a chance with an astronaut. And we needed to do a risk assessment. There were two or three things we were considering. One, we were considering extending uh, missions on the space station from 180 days to 365 days. And we were also looking at longer Mars missions, 180 to 270 days to maybe a thousand days in microgravity. And we just didn't know if anybody were willing to take those risks. And of course, we have no idea what would happen if an astronaut broke a bone. So this is an important one. And clearly, this is another one of those problems where we don't know what the risks are and what's acceptable. We needed to quantify the risk of bone fracture during space missions. Mission duration has varied widely in history from literally seconds or minutes to uh, 435 days. And we can do our assessment based on all the data that's available. In fact, every piece of data available in human history, which is all of our spaceflight data, we have that. We've been keeping good records since, since uh, what was it 60 or 61 when Yuri Gagarin went up? We will calculate the risk parameterized as a function of mission duration. So those are the those are the questions that we need to answer. How long can we extend a mission? The risk estimates are based on past crew experiences. It's a great predictor of risk for future missions since we're going to have similar mission activities and the same crew selection processes. Our state-of-the-art quantitative risk assessment. We're going to avoid any assumptions. All assumptions are usually hard to defend. We use objective priors. We model our priors intelligently. Now, this is another case where we're really talking about the reliability of human bones. So it's a reliability problem. And we know that it only happens after the start of the mission. So it's one-sided. We can use the Weibel model again. We have no reason to believe there are more than one failure mode of human bones in microgravity or during a mission. So we use the Weibel model with its parameters eta and beta. We also use pseudo ignorance priors, and I'll explain why in a minute. It turns out no astronaut has ever broken a bone in space. So we here again use the same kind of same kind of, of pseudo ignorance prior cutoff that we used with uh, the prior example. We let Beta, it's only going to wear out. It's only going to get worse with time. So beta is going to range between one and some really, really old age failure mode 
out at 20. Scale parameter, eta. Since we know the missions are only going to go up to about 1,000 days overall, we'll go to 10 years. That's about three, three times the maximum period that we're going to look at of microgravity exposure. Never going to get to 10 years of microgravity exposure. We sample our joint model of eta beta using MCMC. We calculate the risk of fracture for various assurance levels because nobody has said what assurance level is acceptable to parameterize using Monte Carlo samples of eta and beta, and we plot. It's the same things that we've done before. Let me show you what the data is that we've got, the historical data. No brain fracture, bone fractures, I mentioned this, have ever been reported for any human spaceflight mission. This was done in 2005. There were 977 microgravity exposures of different length. There's no significance to this plot, to so the index number or the order of the data. All crew members are included, 294 flights. It includes all Russian flights, including uh, their space stations, the Salyut space stations, the Mir uh, space stations, and all their other flights, all U.S. flights. There was one Chinese flight included, three Spaceship One flights at the time and all International Space Station missions as of May 2005. 56 MIR missions. The source is astronautics.com. And this is just a scatter plot. You'll notice those points that are all, say, 200 above, those are all MIR. Uh, below 200, the scattered points that you see, and above, say, 50, is, or above 14, really, are all ISS and MIR and Salyut flights. And all the scatter of, of short duration flights are shuttle, Apollo, Gemini, Mercury, uh, all the short duration Russian flights, uh, Chinese flight, et cetera, spaceship one flights. And that's the durations without. Now you'll notice these are all sensor data. We haven't had an event occur, which is why we had to get, had to go to pseudo ignorance priors to make the Markov chain stabilize. But we're looking at thousands of days when the longest exposure, pardon me, not thousands, we're looking at uh, like 3,000 days when the longest exposure has been 400 in our data. The risk, we picked five different assurance levels to parameterize. We, five, 25, 50, 75, and 95% levels. We're 95% sure it'll be less than that, 5% sure less, et cetera. And this is our chart that we got. The bottom is exposure in the, the x axis is exposure in days for microgravity level. And then the risk of having a fracture is on the y axis and it is in percent. And you'll see with that purple line there, the black line is the expected risk or the mean. The ordinate, of course, is the risk of bone fracture for that length of mission. The interpretation is the purple line, for example, tells us that we're 95% sure that the risk is below that line, whatever the whatever the the y value is of that purple line at that x value. For example, we're 90% sure, or pardon me, at 600 days, we're 95% sure that the risk is less than 90%. That may or may not be helpful. But the lower lines we plot as well. Now, of course, the one thing that you can tell also is that 300 days, we're 95% sure that the risk is less than one percent than three percent based solely on the data. No assumptions, no guesses. The black line is the mean, and the reason why I put that there is you can see how that 75th quantile, the blue dash dotted line, you can see how it's below it for a while and goes above. This is one of the things that I've talked about in session two. These probability distributions for these outcomes or worse are going to be totally different at different points in time. Just by looking at the quantiles in the mean, you can see that. So those are the results. That's one way to present them as well, parameterized, which is what we need to do. Here's an alternate display concept. Since we're comparing for various mission durations, we're going to use typical 180 days. They're proposed extending to 365. And Mars missions that may be 180 or 270 days with 540 days on the surface. Mars has a third of a G, which is a little bit of help, but it's not a whole lot. We expect bone mineral density loss, even on Mars. Total mission durations may go up to 1,080 days. We use density strips. I've already shown you density strips. And for the fifth to the 95th quantile. And we also 
reduced a median line in those in those density strips. Uh, let's show there. Here's the logarithmic scale. Fifth and ninety-fifth contours. Contours we put superimposed on the density strips, and you see there that the probability meet where the purple is dark for each of the density strips is on the very very low side. That's good. And we plotted the contours for the fifth, fiftieth, and ninety-fifth on those density strips for various various times. The density strips, if we truncate that chart over at 10 to the minus 8, which is a tiny, tiny risk, we get a better feel for how those, those contours change as a function of time. So that's another way to present those. And if I present them just for the specific decisions that we have, whether or not we want to take the risk of going to 365 days, you see on the left the density strips for the space station mission of 180 days existing, and if they go to 360, how it increases. So those are really, really good for comparison purposes. And of course, I truncated on the right uh, at 10 to the minus site, so you get a better feel. We can see the 50th percentile, which is the black line, goes from about a eh, little larger than 10 to the minus 7th, all the way up to a little more than, little less, a little more than 10 to the minus 4. So there's a huge increase in order, but it's still a pretty small risk. By the way, looking at this chart, they did authorize. This particular chart authorized them to make the decision to go to 365-day missions of the space station back in the 2000 office. Some ass overall assessment. This answers the question of human spaceflight fracture risk based solely on the data. We're 95% certain that the risk is less than 3% after 300 day exposure. It's the reason why we haven't seen any very, very low risk. It provides a state-of-the-art quantitative risk assessment that are believable, repeatable, and sound. And of course, we've employed, before I go forward, we actually employed and looked at additional data and we didn't see anything to change those results. So this is important and it's important to make decisions to go to Mars. Our next case study is another NASA one, which is really important. Space shuttle is getting close to end of life. They have locker doors that, just like the zipper bags, that hold some things. And if a locker door were to fail on ascent or descent, uh, you could lose the vehicle. So the, the consequences are too severe to just go with a, a best guess. So they wanted a quantitative risk. This is something they've been looking at for years. And the reason why is they discovered some loose screws on the hinges and the latch plates on these locker doors. So all of a sudden they got nervous. The way these screws and these connectors are, are built is they had uh, key inserts, which is basically a little crimp at the end where such that when the screw gets inserted to that end, that crimp holds the screw in place. Uh, I guess they didn't want to use Loctite for fear that Loctite would have uh, some sort of chemical outgassing, which might kill the astronauts as well. Something they have to worry about. So they used the key inserts instead. Turned out some of the screws were a little short for the key inserts. The locker door loose screw risk assessment. Problem, some of them are loose. They're too short. If, if a door loses the integrity or falls off, something penetrates the hole. That's just, you lose a shuttle and the crew. What's the risk of having a loose screw that could then lead to the, root, lead to the risk of losing a door? You know, these things cascade. We have a cascade of, of risk. The decision, well, the alternatives they were looking at, well, let's replace and retighten all the screws. Hope for the best. Or, well, let's delay a flight. Let's delay the flight until some new fix is found. Well, those were the two. I will mention that that delay of the flight until the new fix is found was not very satisfactory. That might take years. And they were not going to stop flying to the space station. They had to, in fact every three months or the space station would not be able to reboost and would not be able to uh, stay in orbit. So that's an unpalatable alternative. So the loose screw quantitative risk assessment set up. There's no clear decision rule. Description, decision discriminator is risk of losing a door due to losing screws. However, the failure modes, they had not done the engineering analysis. 
The number of lost screws leading to a lost door had not been defined. We don't know if one screw being loose will lead to a lost door or if it takes six or a particular pattern. They had not set an acceptable risk. We know the risk was low, so we have to parameterize. They had no set assurance level. Remember our idealized example that I gave you at the very beginning with a, with a launch abort system. Those things are specified, so we have to parameterize. We can solve these problems using state-of-the-art quantitative risk assessment. And these are the kinds of things that you face also. I'm sure people out there are identifying with running into these things where nobody's presenting you a nice, clear, clean decision space. We use a simple binomial model for the probability of losing screws and for probability of losing doors as a result of losing screws. In other words, there's a probability that you're going to lose a screw. Okay? This is one of the very few cases that I have done over the past 20 years where you actually had an analytical solution. So I'm going to work through this. This is, I want to show you this because I'm going to show you what happens when you actually do have an analytical solution. Our data was on the hat latch hinge plates. We had eight screws that had been observed loose of 287 that were tested. Obviously they just can't send an engineer to get on the shuttle to test these things. There were no screws that had been lost. That's our other data whether they were loose or whether they were tight. So that's important information. Some more setup. Well, we have a simple integrand for risk of loose screw. We have theta, which is the Bernoulli probability of a loose screw. We have the number of loose screw, lambda. We have the number tested, which is 287. We have eight that were observed loose. So it's a simple probability, or simple likelihood, simple binomial probability. Or we use an objective prior, you can look this up for a Bernoulli model in Bernardo and Smith, and that's what we get. We have a nice analytical posterior. It turns out that when you multiply the likelihood times the prior, as you see there in just to the right of the equal sign, which is the binomial likelihood times the prior, the objective prior, turns out we get a simple beta model, which is a nice analytical solution. We can integrate this. So what are the results? We integrate it, we have our data. Eight screws observed loose in the test, 287 screws tested. Synopsis, well, the mode, most likely risk, is at 2.6% of losing a screw, okay? The mean is 2.95%, 25th percentile is 2.23%, 75th is 355 and there's our plot of that uncertainty model for losing a screw based on the data. Risk and percent on the bottom, and of course a density measure on the left. And you see where the peak is? Now let me show it to you as a density strip. Legend of course is 5th to 95th percentile, and it ranges from 1.5%, 5.2% to 4.5% risk. And uh, by the way, there are codes for density strips using R on my website if you want to download them. Uh, use at your own risk. However, you could certainly, you're getting the source code uh, for the density strips and they allow you to plot multiple on there. So if you want to download the website, that's great. That's what it's there for. If you want to modify it, you can do it. The black line is the median, which is the 50th percentile. The dashed line that you see to the right, dashed gray line is the mean at 2.95%, same numbers we saw before. The mode is at 2.62%, which is the solid gray line. And the dotted lines represent the 25th and 75th percentiles at 2.33% and 3.55%. So this little program that I've developed for producing density strips will allow you to put these other points on there to get some feel for it. Plus, of course, you have the color density, which is directly proportional to the probability of density. So that's another way to present it. Now, what's the risk of loss of a screw given that it's loose? What's well, the probability that a screw will be lost given that it's become loose based on our data? Okay, we use our binomial again. Zero screws were lost of the eight. These are sensor data effectively. It's the same beta model that we got before using, uh, or it's, it's pretty much this very, very similar beta model that we, that we had before using our objective prior. <clears throat> and of course, I can plot it for you. Okay, this is important because we're going to calculate the loss of risk of door, which is dependent on risk of loss of screw. 
what's the risk of loss of a screw given that it's tight? Well, we had, what's the probability that it's going to be lost given that, that it was tight? Well, we had zero that were lost to the 279 that did not have unacceptable back weight torque. So that has a nice analytical solution. Okay. Let's do is 279 in that case. And of course I can plot that for you. Very, very small risk. Our predicted risk. Now, this is a thing that really hasn't been talked about a whole lot. But whenever we're talking about doing a risk assessment, we're predicting what that uncertainty distribution is going to be in the future. If you just use what it is current, in other words, when you calculate a reliability distribution in the future, you are actually predicting what it's going to be. Most people don't predict. Well, we can predict the future. So we can produce predictive distribution based on the existing data. In this particular case, what we do is relatively easy with MCMC, but we had a nice analytical solution for it. For any M screws loose in a pattern of M screws, the risk of losing, uh, the risk of those screws being loose in the future we literally integrate out that theta parameter that we solved for before. And we end up with a nice beta binomial distribution with the following parameters in terms of what we define. I'm not going to go through and rename those. But the fact is, is a simple beta binomial distribution for any mu screws tight in a pattern of screws. Probability of losing them is another beta binomial. These are predictive distributions. And for any total M screws in a pattern of N screws is another beta binomial distribution. And this is all because we use simple Bernoulli distributions for the probability or Bernoulli probability for loss of a screw. Note that the theta parameter, which was our probability of, of having a loose screw, did not even appear or losing a screw in any of our predicted risk distribution formula. That's the nice thing about it. That's what we really don't care what that is. Because we're interested in the future, not what the past was. <clears throat> the predicted risk distributions are formed by multiplying the likelihood for a new datum, a hypothetical datum in the future, at whatever time of interest you're at, by the density of the parameters given the data, or theta, for example. And then you integrate out all the parameters, which is one of those integral transforms that we've talked about and that I showed you. And for this problem, when we do it, we get a nice analytical solution, which is the beta binomial distributions. For others, it's pretty easy to do using Monte Carlo methods once you've got your samples from MCMC. Remember, Monte Carlo, you can approximate an integral, and you can also approximate an integral transform. And that's what we're doing when we integrate out the, the random variables of interest. And that's what we need to do every single time we do an effective state-of-the-art quantitative risk assessment. So the real question that they had to have is, what if they lose a panel door? It's a pretty complex risk question. You got loss of a latch or a hinge plate and cause the loss of the door integrity. Loss of a latch or a hinge plate requires loss of one or more screws. How many lost screws of what pattern will cause the loss of the door? The answer to that last question defines our failure modes. Well, we don't know what the failure modes are, so we have to parameterize as a function of failure modes. This is classic. You're quite often not given the information for what the decision is going to be and how the decision is going to be structured. We could skin that cat by parameterizing as a function of potential failure modes. Any one to six screws lost in a latch or hinge plate can cause door integrity loss. That's conservative, worst case, but it gives us six different six different failure modes. Actually, if you want to know the truth about it, it probably requires a specific pattern, one of the six screws lost. We don't know that. It's realistic, and it's less conservative. But if we can make good decisions based on that worst case scenario, which is something that we've always tried to do, uh, we come out much better. Well, what are the probability equations for risk of a panel door loss? Well, the complete probability equations are usually neglected, and that's usually a mistake. We can write these down. Probability statements for this risk are probability of loss of any door, 
loss of a single panel door. They have single panel doors, double panel doors, and triple panel doors. And of course, it's since they're independent, independent doors, uh, it's just the products of those probabilities. The product loss of a specific door. The probability of loss of any latch or loss of any hinge plate. If you have a certain number of latches, certain number of hinge plates. Probability of loss of a latch, the same as loss of a hedge plate. That's the probability of M screws lost in a pattern of six, the failure mode, which we could calculate. And we also had those beta binomial distributions for each one of those probability equations. And we can put them all together in a simple summation. Probability of M lost, given that J are loose, times the probability of J are loose, plus the probability of M loss, given that J minus six minus J are tight, times the probability of six minus J are tight. <clears throat> and that's the probability of loss of a latch or a hinge plate, which we then fold into these simple equations that we have above us. Now, our predicted risk of panel door failure, we consider all the failure modes one to six. Worst case, we know specific crew patterns are probably what's in it's going to reduce the risk. So let's see what we've got for these failure modes we parameterized. We have a, our failure mode definition, one or more, two or more, all the way up to six. Loss of a single door, loss of a double door, loss of a triple door. We know the numbers of triple doors, double doors, and single doors. Numbers of screws in each, each latch, number of latches and hinge plates. And over to the right, you see the probability of the loss of any door, given our data. If our failure mode is a single screw lost, we'll cause the loss of a door we have a 29% risk. That's pretty high. Now, the engineers knew that it probably took four or more screws to lose a latch or a hinge plate. So, therefore, it would take four or more to lose a door, which is down in the range of four times 10 to the minus 5%. A tiny risk number. Even if just three, that was 4.63 times, e times 10 to the minus 3%. Tiny fraction. They looked at this and said, yeah, let's just live with it. Let's put the screws in, retighten them, and fly with it. Made the decision instantly. Those risks were within their comfort. But we had to parameterize. We had to work around the things that we were not told, the information we were not given, to come up with a solution that they needed. A full state-of-the-art quantitative risk assessment. In this case, where we had complete analytical solutions. And they were actually relatively straightforward and relatively easy to do. This one took right at about two hours to do. Presentation didn't take much longer. So those are our four examples, plus I gave you the nicer example of the walkthrough with the launch abort system. <clears throat> Summary and conclusions for this series of three presentations that I want to, I want to leave you with. State-of-the-art quantitative risk assessment are now possible. Actually, they've been possible about 20 years, but we've got good facility. We've got a lot of proof that they are working, and they're easy to do, really. Easier than you expect. They're also pretty cheap. We can use decision and information theoretic based approach that are sound. We can avoid all assumptions, all guesses. In any, typically what happens is when you make guesses, you're more conservative then what the most objective assumption or the most objective model would predict. Over-conservatism over always costs you money. We can use all of the data and the information, including outliers and sensor data. A lot of the tools that we've got, we can't use sensor data or even outliers for that matter. But with state-of-the-art quantitative risk, we have. You saw a bunch in these four examples. And really, it boils down to only needing to write out our formula for that integrand, code up a quick MCMC. We don't really need to do a lot of math solutions. We need to do the math to properly describe the problem, but you need to do that anyway. And all those case study examples are done in less than four hours, including the presentation. And there was less than a page of code for each one of them. That's pretty astounding. If you think about it, because those were complicated, important problems. Each one of them had been labored over for a long, long time. And decisions were easy to make. 
The thing that I've found in doing these for the past 20 years is that, that these state-of-the-art quantitative risk systems always agree with decision maker heuristics. They're always comfortable with them. And a properly, the last point I want to get to you is properly done state-of-the-art quantitative risks lead to better decisions, which lead to more, much more cost-effective big R risk management. And obviously, they lead to more effective project management. So I want to thank you very much for your, your attention to this. Uh, thank you so much, Mark. And I, I, want to, I want to thank you for the uh, three sessions and to everyone watching this session. And in case you've missed the previous days that Mark was doing, make sure you watch the replay because he's going through the whole journey that will be very useful to you. But from my side, I mean, the key takeaways are, are unbelievable. I mean, first of all, this, is, this actually happened. And I mean, most of the problems were life or death matters. Very significant uh, where risk management, risk analysis rather, helped make a better decision. But for me, the, the kind of the two really unusual or amazing takeaways were, first, if it never happened before, it doesn't mean it will never happen again. And you can actually quantify what the likelihood of an event occurring is. And, and the second one, so yeah, th that usual excuse that people give us is we don't have any, 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 any data. Um, that, that is all, first of all, is not true. But second, that really doesn't stop proper risk analysis. And uh, um, the second key takeaway for me was which it, it, it is kind of reinforced through many other workshops during the Risk Awareness Week. But you again, you saw how it makes decision makers' life much easier is that we don't have to give one solution we actually always represent a whole range of possible outcomes. We show the full kind of breadth of data to the decision makers, and that makes it much easier, much more comfortable for the decision makers to actually you know, make the choice, which they couldn't have made for, year, uh, for, you know, for, for an extended period of time just talking about it and getting emotions involved. Um, and that's the power of proper, of proper risk analysis. Yeah, the... Uh... You know, one of my experiences, been is that a lot of decision makers, you know, they don't want to reveal what the risk officer is. They don't want to reveal, for example, that they're willing to take a really large risk. They'd rather nobody know that. That's or they don't. Moment. And they don't want to reveal also that, that they're real conservative. They don't want to appear, you know, they're, they're managers, they're bosses. If they're over conservative, the managers are, are not going to like it. If they're too risky, too much of a cowboy, they, uh, they don't like that either. They like somewhere in the medium, and most people are cautious. And, and as I mentioned in session two, and this is a good reason, a good reason for people to look at the replay, you know, it's a, um, that's one of the reasons why utility theory or applications of utility theory fails is because the decision makers values and their risk tolerance changes with time. Um, one, uh, just a, a silly example I can mention. If I wanted to take off vacation where I was working, sometimes it was better to, better to hit the boss at the end of the day when they're anxious to go home to, to ask for that. It was a lower risk of them saying no than it was if I asked, say, at 10 a.m. during the day when they're facing the hard part of the day. So, I mean, that's a silly example, but it's, it's an example of how their values and their, their risk tolerance changes during oh. the day. And that's, that's, that's within a single day. And it happens to all of us. It's natural and it's human nature. And the thing is, is that if we can present the full spectrum to them, if, even if they haven't presented to us, they can find the sweet spot. And when they find the sweet spot, they can make the decision right then and there and be comfortable with it. Yeah. So uh, and, those, and those are two good points. The, absolutely, and that's the ultimate kind of objective of uh, of risk analysis: help the decision makers make an informed and a comfortable decision within their appetite at the time. That's yeah. very that's very very powerful. So um, everyone, I hope you join me in thanking. 
Mark in the comments. Uh, um, you can always reach out to Mark using his contact details. It's also underneath this, uh, this video. You can click on the buttons and go to the website, to the link, LinkedIn page. And if you have any questions, just write them underneath in the comment section as well. All right, man. Thank I'll just you. I'll just end. Thank you, thank you, Alex. And I'll just end with uh, the the reference references that I use. So thank everybody for their participation, and I uh, hope I've opened some eyes or presented some insights that you'll find useful. See you in the next workshops. All right. Thank you, Alex. Bye.